Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. Today we're going to be rolling out a new ministry that is an addition to all of the things that we already do. It's hard to keep up with everything that we're doing around here, but this one is important. So Mike and Mark, Mike Bermigliano and Mark Lebrecht for about a year have been praying about starting a care ministry for the house, for the people of God here in the house. And they're going to start that. They've already started right now. It's going to be called Family Care. Family care is for anyone who's in the hospital or nursing homes or shut-ins or anything like that where we find our widows that have a need, if they need their grass cut or anything like that, we'll make sure and take care of things like that, like transportation around town, pickups and drop-offs and things like that. So I know a lot of you have a heart for stuff like that. So if you would, today, after we say amen, they are both going to be in the information center. They'd like to talk to you about it if you'd like to join them. If you'd like to volunteer to be a part of that, that's going to be fantastic because it's a great, it's pastoral ministry is what it is. And I think it's going to be a great addition to what we do. And so what that means is that if you know somebody that's in the hospital and they need a visit, you contact us and we'll make sure that Mike and Mark get that out to their team and they'll get there as fast as possible. It's just going to be a great thing because it happens quite frequently. Matter of fact, we've got some people watching from the hospital this morning. Donna Smith is in the hospital. Glad to have you there. You just told me that there's a first-time guest watching from Washington State. We're glad to have you with us this morning. Welcome to our online crew. Uh, if you have your Bible, turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 11. Last thing for the men. Men, not women. Women are already trying to jump in on this. It ain't happening. August the 24th, Saturday, we're having tacos and testimonies. So the last time we had the Beast Feast, we had to block three women at the door. <laughs> this time is going to be worse, I'm sure, because everybody likes tacos. <laughs> so we're going to be preparing tacos and giving some great testimonies, and, and I'll be telling you a little bit more about that as it comes. But if you're a man and you'd like to be there, for this, I think we have about 50 spaces available so we will encourage you to get in part in that and get involved in that. Are you there this morning at 2 Samuel chapter 11? If you wouldn't mind, in honor of God's word, would you stand together as we read these five verses together? If you have your Bible at home, follow along with us. Let us know in the chat where you're watching from. 2 Samuel chapter 11, starting in verse 1. It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when the kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Those words critical. But David remained at Jerusalem. The beginning of verse 2. Then it happened. One evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. I don't know that there is any other kind. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. And the woman conceived... So she sent and told David and said, I am with child. You may be seated, if you will, taking those words in. This morning, I want to press in on what I think is one of the most overlooked aspects of the story of David and Bathsheba. The revealed and common consequence, if you will, of improper positioning or as we say it in the South, not being where you're supposed to be when you shouldn't be there. Uh, some, of you, some of you know my story. Many of you don't. If you've never heard parts of it, don't, don't judge me. Don't judge me. You've done worse. But for me, those that don't know, I was expelled in the first semester of the 11th grade in high school. In the first semester of the 11th grade in high school, they called me to the principal's office and threw me out. Never return. Don't come back. Don't even go get your books out of your locker. Get out. It was pretty, pretty exciting. Um, 
It was a defining moment in my life. It truly was a defining moment in my life that, that was the culmination of a lot of things that was just swirling in my life at the time. 16 years old, you know, without meaning to, I had gotten known by the principal and the vice principal of the school by name because I had gotten into so much mischief. And to, to prove to you, if you will, that, that nothing in your life is ever wasted. It all ties together. A little bit of this sermon originated from all of that. So here it is 45 years later. One day in my sophomore year, which was 10th grade, the year before that, I was skipping class again at the high school, St. Augustine High School. I was skipping class, and I was doing all the stuff that you do when you're skipping class. I was ducking teachers, and I was hiding in the hallways, and I would run into the bathrooms, and you know, you just kept moving so you could not be discovered. At one moment, I was walking down the end of C Hall at St. Augustine High School, for those alumni who may be here. I was walking down at the other end of C Hall, and I looked all the way to the end of the hallway on the other end, and there was the vice principal of the school, Bruce Bishop. Any of y'all that went to St. Augustine High School, Bruce Bishop, that was a scary son of a gun. I'm at the other end of C Hall. He's at that end of C Hall, which is a good long distance, and before I could duck and pucker, before, before I could duck, he screamed, Cochran, where are you supposed to be? You better get there before something bad happens. And I was like, yes, sir. <laughs> and that is a part of my sermon today, that you need to be where you are supposed to be when you are supposed to be there. As we read from the life and the story of David, we're going to bear this thought out all morning long. So let's pray for wisdom. Let's pray together. Father, give us a word in this moment. Help us to hear what we haven't heard yet before. Give us revelation that changes the course. And we thank you for it. And they said together, amen. amen. I believe that one of the most underexplored topics in all of the Bible is something that we could loosely explain as the time or the timing of God. I don't think it's explored as, as, as much as it should. It's, it's usually not as exciting as it should because even though he is, as the Bible defines him, he is the alpha and the omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the first and the last. Even though he exists before time and before time was ever created, God was existent. And to this very moment, God exists outside of the boundaries of the time that he created. He doesn't exist in the boundary of time. What we have to know is that time and timing is critical in the way that God works. Maybe you've lived long enough to know that now, that time and timing is critical to the way that God works in our lives. Uh, it typically doesn't get as recognized as it should as it is rolling out, but when it is recognized, we are typically all stricken by the detailed nature in which our God works. We may live a lot of our lives not even noticing how it happens, but then when we get revelation and we see it and we see how God works, we, we, we find that nothing at all is ever random. Brothers and sisters, realize and remember this in your life that nothing is ever random in your life. Nothing is meaningless. Nothing is ever disconnected from everything else. Nothing that we have or do or experience exists in a vacuum, but everything that happens in our walk in our lives with God is very, very specific. It is very specific to how it happens for us. You could just say that and go on, but somebody may need to hear this, that right now, you may need to hear this because sometimes we think that life is random and meaningless. You may need to hear this more than you thought that you needed to hear it because it's true that sometimes we just fall into this cycle where we start to believe that life is meaningless and life is random and it's all just this disconnected bunch of foolishness and tomfoolery that happens in our lives. Even though Solomon said, vanity of vanity, says the Lord, all is vanities. The sun comes up, the sun goes down, nothing matters anywhere. Shakespeare, William Shakespeare said, life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Sometimes we can forget that. And in the midst of the chaos of it all, sometimes we forget that, listen to this revelation, the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. Amen. Don't ever forget that. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. That, that literally means that every, ooh, I love this stuff. Every step that you take in your life means something. 
Every place, the Bible says every place on which the sole of your foot treads, God has given it to you. So every place that you are, he is. And it's already been foreordained and preplanned that you would be there. It means that it is prepared, it is set up, it is established, and it is appointed. It just does something in you when, you're no, when you know this, that your life as a child of God is not, listen, the chaos that you think that it is. But it is an orchestration of events by God himself in which one thing is connected to another that is connected to another that is connected to another. Solomon said, the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. Solomon further said, when you walk, your steps will not be hindered. And when you run, you will not stumble. Somebody may need to hear this. It changes the way you live your life when you recognize that before he formed you in your mother's womb, your path was already laid out. It was already established that to this very moment of your life, somebody who's feeling like it doesn't mean anything, right now you need to hear this. His eye is on the sparrow and he watches over you. Not one hair of your head will fall to the ground that your father does not know about. He is already in your tomorrow working it out for your good today. You have nothing to fear in this life. But how often is it? What often happens is that instead of living in the rush of being carried about by the hand of God, we get caught up in the day-to-day drudgery of it all. I'm going to preach before I get out of here. We get caught up in the day-to-day drudgery of it all. One day bleeds into the next day, and we can forget the time and the timing of God. Mm. The time and the timing of God. It's not just incidental to your life. It is critical to your life. We can forget sometimes that God answers prayers in three ways. Sometimes God says yes. Sometimes God says no. And sometimes God says wait. I like yes. Not a fan of no. But wait, the devil is a liar. (laughs) And if you're waiting, here's why. The, the, The small explanation of the larger experience that if you're waiting, it is entirely because, listen, it is not time yet. Not time yet. When's my miracle coming? When is my breakthrough gonna happen? I'm tired. Why do I have to keep going through this? Why do I have to keep waiting? When is the time going to turn and when is it going to happen for me? Here's your answer. Not one second before or not one second after he said so. And you have to be willing to accept that and flow with that because if you don't, you will create consequences in your life where they should not have been. There are several concepts as, as revealed in the Bible about time. And I, I'm not going to go too, too heavy with this because I got somewhere else to be. Two of the most recognized are Kronos and Kairos. Kronos is exactly what you think it is. Kronos is the the clock. It is the tick-tock. It is the calendar. It is the day, week, month, year. That's the way that we separate the days of our lives is by the the calendar. We know that Kronos is 24-7, Monday through Friday, 365. That is Kronos time revealed in the Bible. Kairos, however, is something entirely different. Kairos is something that we understand, listen, as the timing of God. It is the timing in which God works. You see, God doesn't necessarily confine, I love this stuff. God doesn't necessarily confine himself to the restrictions of the chronos, but but, but God lives and abides in this thing called the kairos. It is recognized as God's timing for a particular thing, most specifically, the appointed time for the purposes of God, which means that when it is meant to happen, It's going to happen. Don't fall asleep on me yet. Plenty of time for that later. In Galatians chapter 4, when when Paul is telling the story of the incarnation, Paul by revelation said, Galatians 4, 4, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. When it was time for it to happen, that right there is when it happened, which, which means that when it was meant to happen, it happened. That is the timing of God. From our viewpoint, which is always going to be limited and carnal, we look at a thing and we say, okay, now's a good time for this to happen. You ever do that? 
You, you've been dealing with it. You've been walking through it. You've been trying to deal with it the best you can. You look up at God and say, okay, now's a good time for you to do something. Now's a good time for this to turn around. Now, I've waited long enough. I'm ready. And when you tell God I'm ready, what that means is you're not ready. <laughs> Write it down. Tweet it out. Tell your friends. But from the vantage point of God Almighty, our God, who knows the end from the beginning, the ancient of days, the old black church used to say, the one who sits high and looks low. Nothing could be further from the truth because if this happened right now, whatever it was that you say I'm ready for, if it happened right now, it would be a disaster. I don't know why. Things go right and things go wrong entirely based on the timing of God. And unfortunately, everything in our lives is attached to that. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, to everything there is a time and a season for every purpose under the heaven. That means there is an appointed occasion. This is going to happen, but it is going to happen on time. Every challenge that you have in your life, every change that you have in your life, every victory that you have in your life, every temptation that you will face in your life, every breakthrough that you will have and every breakdown that you will have, there is a time for that thing to happen. And what you learn the longer you go is that time and timing is always critical to your victories as well as your defeats. That, beloved, is the foundation for the sermon for this morning. Exhibit A is 2 Samuel chapter 11, which sets the stage for one of the most epic meltdowns recorded in the Bible. You've had some meltdowns in your life, but I don't know that you've ever had one on this level. This, this downfall of David. God. I can't even articulate that. I can't without it bothering me because he is my hero. 90% of all people know the story of David and Bathsheba, but they don't know what made it happen. This is what made it happen. Verse 1 shows that when it was time for the kings to go out to battle, there was an appointed time for them to go. There was a certain season of the year that they could go out to battle. The Bible says that David remained at Jerusalem. When it was time for war, the man of war stayed home. Accident, coincidence, laziness, pure, spontaneous, irresponsible behavior, we don't know. But when it was time for war, and David was a man of war, he should have been with his army in that battle when it was time for war. The man of war stayed home. And then verse 2 just says, then it happened. Those three words, then it happened. What this puts on display is one of the most powerful lessons of all of our lives. And I'm hoping that I can communicate it in a way that you'll take it home with you. That you need to be where you need to be when you are supposed to be there. Because anything else puts you in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people. And one thing we know about trouble, mm-hmm, maybe I'll sing it. One thing we know about trouble is that trouble happens when you're in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people. Y'all can help me preach if you want to, or sit there and act like you're God's favorite child who ain't never stepped in nothing. But I'm not going to. All over this building, there are people who can tell that story. That the reason you got into the trouble that you got into was not because you went looking for it, but because you were in the wrong place at the wrong time. You shouldn't have gotten into that car. You knew you should not have. Maybe one of you, two of your friends told you, you should not get in that car to go with them right now, but you got in that car, at the wrong car at the wrong time, and it cost you more than you can believe. You should not have said yes when Delilah batted her eyelashes. <laughs> oh, my wife don't take care of me. She thinks I'm special. No, she does not. She just doesn't know what a dog you are. <laughs> you should not have stayed when your friend said, let's just have one more. 
Young people, y'all better listen to your pastor right now because I'm preaching your future. You should not stay when that one friend says, let's, let's just have one more, and you end up in the headlines of tomorrow's newspaper. You should not have, I'm going to preach. Y'all all right? You should not have listened when your thrice divorced hoochie friend told you that he works too much. He does not deserve you. He needs to be hanging out with you. No, that man's trying to make a living to put food on the table to pay the bills so that we can live a life and raise our kids. Oh, he don't deserve you. Shut up. I've lived. I'm going to get mad now. Because some of y'all have fallen victim to that. You have. You know, you're thinking of a name right now. You're going to message her on Facebook when you get home. You know what he said today? The only thing he didn't do was call you by name, Sally. <laughs> I've lived long enough now to see this in living color in my own life that there were times when I knew that I should have been somewhere else, but I stayed just a little bit longer than I should have. And that one moment of staying longer than I should have caused me something. And when the un stuff started, <laughs> thank you, Lord. When, it st <laughs> when the stuff started unraveling, it was too late for me to get out of it. Now, that sounds great, Pastor. This is a, it's a great little pep talk, but how am I going to know? I'm going to make this so simple that a caveman could understand it. Y'all ready? The Word of God, the Spirit of God, the people of God. Amen. Write it down. <laughs> Write it down. The Word of God, the Spirit of God, the people of God. That's it. They all work together as God's positioning system. I came up with that myself. I don't know if anybody knows this, but I... He ain't paying attention. He's on Facebook right now. Here we go. Show me a believer in the Word, and I will show you a person who understands right place, right time, wrong place, wrong time. Where's all my Bible thumpers at? Show me somebody who is in the Word, and I'll tell you people that understand right place, right time, wrong place, wrong time. You instinctively know because the Word of God is, a, is this lamp that is in your life that it shines on things that everybody else trips on. Solomon said, so read the book of Solomon or Proverbs. He said, don't go where you should not be. The Word of God just simply tells you there are things and places that that you should not be in. The Word of God, if you will just read it, it, get it down into your soul. The Word of God can deliver you. The Spirit of God. The Apostle Paul said, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, when you intentionally place yourself in His care, when you intentionally put your life in His hands and say, I'm just stupid enough to get into trouble, but I'm going to trust you today to lead me out into this crazy world that I'm in, the Holy Spirit will take charge of your thoughts, your life, your words, and show you where you need to be. He will not lead you into temptation. So when you find yourself in temptation, you have to know that that is not the Spirit of God. Psalms 30, or Proverbs 30, Psalms 32, help me, Lord. David said, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go, and I will guide you with my eyes. Psalms 23, David said, he leads me beside the still waters. He takes me to greener pastures, which is the picture of a life that is led by God. John 16 of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, he will guide you into all truth. The word of God, the spirit of God, the people of God. The word of God. The Spirit of God, the people of God. Somebody say this with me, the right people. You know who you need in your life? The right people. The right people. Uh, they'll tell you that in an AA meeting. We say that in church and you say, you're judging me. No, you need the right people in your life. Who am I talking about? People of wisdom. People of wisdom. Elders. Nobody said nothing. Amen. Those old people, they smell like mothballs. Those elders. Gray-haired folk. Where's my gray-haired folk at? Gray-haired folk. People with wisdom. Gray-haired folks with wrinkles. You need them in your life. Because why? Because they've already walked that same street that you are looking down right now. They've already stepped in that mess and tripped over that stumbling block. What you do not need in your life are more train wreck people. That's what you don't need in your life. Who says more train wreck people who, who, who's refrain. You can clean this all up next week. Who, whose refrain is. Whose refrain is. Well, let's just see what happens. 
run from that fool fast as you can. Because it's probably going to be a mess. You don't need those people in your life who say, oh, go on, just have some fun, live a little. You, you, you restrict yourself too much, live a little. <laughs> and when you end up as a resident in a crossbar hotel holding numbers in front of your face, that fool ain't going to bail you out because he don't have $2 in his pocket. Who you do need in your life, man, I feel good in here today. Who you do need in your life are people who will consistently say to you, have you prayed about it? If you've got friends in your life who never ask you, have you prayed about that? You need new friends. Have you prayed about that? Have you fasted? Have you pushed away from the dinner table to seek God with all of your heart? Have you sought God about this thing? At this point in my life, I've seen it. And I'm trying to share it to somebody so you don't have to go. That in your life, you need to be where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there. Put some shoes on this. When it's time for you to pray, and everybody knows that there are times in your life when the dilemma that you are facing is so great that the only answer that you have is to pray. When that time comes, you don't need to be running around trying to figure it out and make something happen. When it's time for you to pray, you need to be in a place where you can pray. I don't know where that is for you. If it's in your car, your bedroom, in your prayer closet, at your church, at an altar, I don't know where that is for you. Too many people are playing when it's time for them to be praying. You don't need to be going out one more night. You need to be standing in the gap to pray because when you pray, things start to change. When it's time to go to war, spiritual warfare, you don't need to be without your armor, sitting in the enemy's camp, warming yourself by the enemy's fire and wondering why you keep getting burned. I'm preaching better than y'all are shouting right now. When it's time to be a parent to your children, I'm going to preach now. When it's time for you to be a parent to your children, there is nothing in this world that is more important to you as a parent than to be a parent to your children. When it is time for you to parent your child, that is where you need to be. As Y'all say it. Amen. As a parent, that is your primary ministry is your children. When it's time for dad to be dad. He does not need to be out running around living out his teenage fantasies and flirting with somebody at the water cooler. He needs to be dad. When it's time for mom to be mom, she doesn't need to be out running around living her best life, planning her next woman's night out. She needs to be parenting her children. When it's time, you need to be where you need to be when it's time for you to be there. When it is time for you to lead something. And this world right now is desperate for leaders. Good God Almighty. We got people running the country that we wouldn't even let run a Boy Scout troop. Ah! You don't need to be squandering your gifts and hiding in a crowd waiting for someone else to do it. The word says when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people mourn. One of the reasons we got all this hell that we got going on in our country right now is because too many anointed people stood back and let ridiculous people step forward. Where's Clay Murphy? You go, son. You run. You need to be where you need to be when it's time for you to be there. When it's time for you to serve. Not a word, huh? You don't need to believe that everything in life is about you and everybody needs to be taking care of you and that servants are suckers. You don't need to believe that. When it's time to serve, you need to be where you need to be, serving God and serving people. Amen. Serving God and serving people. When it's time to witness and share your faith, that's where you need to be. Every day you are in a mission field and the word of God says to tell the world the story of Jesus. Every day you need to be sharing it. When it's time to plant seed, you need to be planting seed or you will have no harvest in your future. When it's time to stand, you stand. When it's time for you to step, you step. 
Y'all getting what I'm laying down? Yes. Whether you see it or not, God is constantly at work moving and positioning you to get you where you need to be. And when you step into that place, whatever that place is, the appointed place, miracles happen. They may not look like what you want them to look like. But when you step into that place that God wants you to be, that's when miracles start to happen. Joseph went through all that he went through, but he ended up in position to save a nation and save his entire family after all the hell that he had to endure to get there. Elijah went to Mount Carmel and stared down 850 false prophets of Baal and Ashtaroth, but when he was finished, revival swept the nation. Daniel went into slavery, but he became the governor of Babylon, which put him into position to be the ruler of all of the Hebrews in captivity, which was right woo, where he needed to be. It may be that... The place God wants you is a lion's den, but it'll be a lion's den where you are in charge, not the lions. It may be a fiery furnace, but the fire will not burn you and the smoke will not get on you. It may be a season or two in a job that you hate being in, but when you are supposed to be with there, miracles will start to happen. Brothers and sisters, don't curse your dark places. Shine while you are in them. Amen. Don't curse the darkness. Stand in those places and just, just say it out loud. I'm going to glorify God in this or I'm going to die trying. I'm going to glorify God with this. I hate where I'm at right now. But I'm going to glorify God in it. Not only do miracles happen when you are in the place that God wants you to be, but Bible people, oracles happen. Right now, you're Googling Oracle. <laughs> Isn't that a loan company? Oracle. It's a car rental company? No. An Oracle is a word straight from heaven into your life. An Oracle. You get words from heaven. You get fresh revelation. Most of the people that you know right now, unfortunately, are just stale. Nobody said nothing. They're just stale because they're not operating in fresh revelation. They're not seeking God daily for a word from heaven. They're not as led by the Spirit of God as they should be. I've only ever had it one time in my life, one time, and, and it was 30 years ago, and it hasn't happened since. One night I was, I was sent out, well, 40 years ago, I was sent out by my pastor to go on visitation. That was back in the days when we still came to your house. We don't do that anymore. Ain't I, no, we don't. <laughs> Matter of fact, you come to my house and ring the doorbell, I'm looking at you. I ain't opening the door. <laughs> Any of y'all got a ring on your house and you look at your ring and go, oh, no, no, I'm not, I ain't ready for that. <laughs> and then you act like you're not home. Hey, I'm at the office. Just leave it there. I'll, I'll. Anyway, some of y'all are flabbergasted. You think I'm kidding. I ain't kidding. My home's my castle. Where was I? I was sent out on visitation. <laughs> Squirrel. I was sent out on visitation to go out visiting the people that had visited our church, and it was horrible, but I did it. And I, this is a true story. It happened 40 plus years ago. It's only the only time it's ever happened in my life. I was driving, and I was young in my faith. I was just on fire, you know. I just wanted to serve God. I was probably 20 years old. I just want to serve the Lord. I'm driving and I pray, just pray, God, wherever I go, whoever I meet, let me be your hands and feet, let me be a blessing. I'm driving it, and I swear to you, I hear in my spirit, turn left. I'm driving down A1A South, and I'll never forget, thank God there was a road there. <laughs> I turn left. This is exciting, man. I'm like, let's go. I turn left, and I, and I just start down this road. I, I, it's in my old neighborhood, so I, I knew kind of where I was, and I'm driving down there, and, and the Spirit of God said, turn right. I turn right into a driveway of a house. No idea where I'm at. Don't know who that house is. 
God said, go knock on the door. I was like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> said, led by the Spirit, I feel crazy. As I'm walking up to the door, God is my witness. God is my witness. As I'm walking up to the door, I hear a woman inside. She screamed, help me, please. Help me, please. Help me, please. Help me, please. The old police instinct kicked in. No, I didn't kick the door down, but I wanted to. <laughs> that would have been cool. That would have been a great part of the story. I kicked the door in, and I pulled my magnum out and shot three people. <laughs> I, I, I walked up to the door, and she said, help me, please. Help me, please. And so I knocked on the door, and she said, please come in. And I opened the door, and when I stepped in, there was a woman in the room by herself lying on a couch hooked up to IVs with machinery all around her. She was in the final stages of cancer. And she said, I was feeling so bad, and I was just praying for God to send somebody by. And I said, everybody else was busy. He sent me. <laughs> so here I am. It, I, and I thought, I thought, that's so good. I thought that was going to happen every day of my life <laughs> after that. And, and it's 45 years later, and I'm like, not again. I must have screwed that up. <laughs> God's like, don't send him again. Check. <laughs> I don't know. Ladies, y'all, join me. I don't know what God is speaking to you. I, I, I don't. But I'll tell you what I know for me. I'm at a place in my life where I truly want to be where I'm supposed to be. Amen. That's all I care about right now. 60, uh, December, I'll be 63. I want to be where I'm supposed to be, even if that means to be what looks like the wrong place. We say it all the time, but we don't even think about it. In Psalm 23, he says, he prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. The last place I want to be is at a table in the presence of my enemies. I don't like them. They don't like me. Well, let's just leave it at that. I'm at that place in my life where I want to be where he wants me to be, no matter what that looks like. You need, as I speak to this house, you need to be where you need to be when you need to be there, even if it's uncomfortable. God has called you to serve. You need to serve. God has called you to lead. You need to lead. When it's time to pray, you don't need to be calling all your Jesus friends to pray for you. You need to find a place to pray and get in that closet and pray. It's time for you to stand. You need to stand. Because when you stand, something amazing is going to happen. When it's time for you to step, step out on faith, you need to be where he needs you to be when you're supposed to be there. I want some people to join me today in praying. Take my life, Lord. Just take my life. All of me. All of me. Position me. Position me to be where you want me to be, not where I want to be. Position me to be in that right place at that right time so that I might be the voice in somebody's wilderness, that I might be the hands and the feet of God in that particular moment. Position me to be where you want me to be, not where I want to be. Because if I was where I wanted to be right now, I'd probably be sitting in a lounge chair with a frilly... Anyway, I would be... <laughs> That's not true. I'd be right where God wants me to be. Position me to be where you want me to be. I believe this is a word, this is a fresh word for this house. Because where we are is not where God wants us to be and where we're going is right where he wants us to be. We have to find our faith and find our courage to step into that and, and follow that and obey that no matter what. With no plan B, there is no plan B. With God, there is no plan B. I want you, if you will, to just join with me this morning. In a few moments, I'm going to open the altar to pray. And I just want some people to say, God, here's my life. Take my life, all of it. We don't pray like that much anymore. Take my life, 
all of it. I don't want to be religious. Take my life, all of it. I surrender. I surrender. Go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I surrender. I surrender. And in your surrender, you will be where he wants you to be. And when you are where he wants you to be, miracles happen. <clears throat> miracles happen. When you are where he wants you to be, oracles happen. Words from heaven begin to flow. Heaven comes to earth. Truth invades deception. Lives change. Your marriage, I, God help me, your marriage will get better. When you, either one of you or both of you, takes that walk to an altar and says, here I am, Lord, I surrender everything. I hold back nothing. I've got really nothing else. I surrender it all to you. When you do that, then you'll see. Marriage will be restored. Your life will turn in new directions. The moment I'm going to give that invitation, and I just want to find somebody who feels this burning in their hearts this morning like I do. I thought my days were over. I find that was a bit premature. So now I'm praying, God, the rest of my life is yours. Every step, every moment is yours. Here's my life. I surrender. You do that, God will take you there. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.